Well, good morning. I'm a physician and researcher at the Indiana University School of Medicine. And this is what I study. This is a CT scan of a nice lady I took care of last week. This is showing pulmonary embolism. Those arrows are pointing to big blood clots in the arteries to the lungs. Now, pulmonary embolism can be serious stuff. It's the second leading cause of sudden unexpected death in young adults. And it causes a lot of anxiety among patients and healthcare providers. I'm an emergency physician, and let me tell you about what I have to do. My job is to go into a room and build immediate trust with a stranger, to create understanding and empathy. And understanding requires listening and seeing. And I have to do it under adverse circumstances and fast. Now, come along with me on a shift to understand. It's 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and it is busy. We're busting at the seams. We've got 20 souls on board. We've got 20 in the waiting room, and we're working a trauma code. We're part of a trauma team. Young man lays in front of us, gunshot wound through the head and through the abdomen. We're on a trauma team. There's adrenaline everywhere. There's terse words. There's egos flying around. We all know what we're doing, but we don't know what we're doing. There's, organi there's organization. There's disorganization that borders on chaos as we struggle to control the damage. But we know the prognosis is grim. Now, we've got to walk down the hallway to the family waiting room, and we've got to talk to a mother and tell her about the apocalypse that her son, if he survives, may never be the same again. Now, we've got to crawl out of our despair and snap back to reality. Overhead, nurse says, Medic alert, 15 minutes out. Chest pain alert, hallway, hallway nine. And we have to go see our next patient. And we've got to lean into his humanity. He's 45 years old. He's here at 2 in the morning. Our first thought is he looks pretty good. He's got some chest pain, a little trouble breathing. His wife told him to come to the emergency department. First thought, maybe he's just a little anxious. I don't think too much is going on. EKG looks normal. Vital signs look okay, no medical history. I got a little percent worry that this could be a blood clot. Maybe it's 2 or 3%. Maybe it's as much as 5%. That's the problem with grizzly bears. 95% vegetarian. <laughs> so I think, I'm going to order all the tests. He's got two kids, including one that imparts a lot of radiation and costs thousands of dollars. But in the back of my mind, he looks pretty good. First, we got to turn to our nemesis, the electronic healthcare record that was supposed to solve so many problems but created more. See all these fields? It goes on and on if we scroll down into infinity. And what this thing is, is an invoice to the insurance company. It doesn't record my real thoughts. Nowhere does it ask me, what did you really think of this man? The medical record has become such a focus of attention. I've snapped a few pictures in our emergency department. Look at these physicians, what the focus of their attention is. It's the wheeling computer that has the electronic health record on it. The gentleman whose back is to you is doing a research study to investigate the impact of the electronic health care record as a thing that gets between us and the patient, literally. This is the view of many patients. Those peepers are your physician. It's gotten so bad. Some of our physicians actually taped their <laughs> photograph on the front of the computer so they can see their doctor's name. Is this quality medical care? So this is summarizing a great deal of research about what patients believe is medical care of, of good quality. First, they want doctors and nurses that are competent and capable, and they want their care given in a clean and well-lighted place. But they also want attitudes that can understand and an open belief. They want open hearts and open minds. That's where the faith comes in. It's the portal to our soul, but it's also connected to our wellness, to our cardiovascular health. The faith is capable of making 10,000 expressions, 3,000 of which convey an emotion. 
When it comes to illness, there is no poker face. What brought me here is my research. Look at these videos of real patients who gave me their permission to show their images to you. Look at their micro expressions, what they show you and what they don't show you. You can make inferences about their wellness and health. When I show these videos to physicians and I just give them a couple of pieces of information, they are just as accurate at detecting wellness and health, people that have nothing wrong with them, as the expensive diagnostic tests. And what's more, we can show these videos to, e to non-healthcare providers, and they're almost as accurate, or even children. This is an innate ability that we have to look at loved ones' faces and tell if they're sick. For years, I taught to residents and to medical students where they would ask me, how did you know that lady had pulmonary embolism? And I'd say, well, she looked like she was doing her taxes, and it wasn't tax season. <laughs> the look of worry, distraction, tiredness, a little bit of disgust. It's a mixed face. And from that, I developed this research interest of turning the face into a diagnostic instrument. This is an old idea. Darwin talked about it in 1872 when he wrote that facial expressions are conserved within species and even transferred across species to show the same emotions as well as health and wellness. Paul Ekman, a famous psychologist, found that facial expressions of tribesmen in Papua New Guinea conveyed the same emotions as facial expressions of people in New York City, all of us have the same facial expressions when it comes to illness. And this is something that you know every day. Again, you can look at a family member just at their face and tell if someone's sick. I think a lot of people I know can look at their dog and tell if their dog is sick just by looking at their face. This is an innate ability. And it comes from the fact that the face is such a complex entity, a complex organ. It's made of 46 muscles that can contract across a wide range it takes 26 of them to smile. And this organ is connected to the body. It's a gift that's given to us at birth, actually. In the neonatal intensive care unit, the nurses look at the relaxation ex expression of the baby's faces to tell about their heart and lungs and vital organs as much as they listen to the beeping machines or look at the numbers on the wall. And they even use the face to assess response to treatments, such as music therapy. And this is because the face is connected to the brain and the brain is connected to the body. We're literally hardwired that our face shows our cardiovascular wellness as illustrated by the neural inputs here from the heart, lung, and blood vessels to the brain and to the face. Now this can be studied using a scientific method called the facial action coding system. It, is, it assigns numeric values to each facial muscle, and these numeric values can be aggregated into lumps that show certain emotions and certain expressions. This was invented by Paul Ekman, who I mentioned earlier. It's difficult to do, it's laborious, and my research coordinators actually make this face when I ask them to do this. <laughs> it is extremely time-consuming and difficult, and for that reason, we use computerized methods now. But alas, if you go to your local emergency department, this is the state of the art you're going to get. The Wong Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale. I like this blogger's interpretation of it. <laughs> My favorite, number four. Huh? I never knew that about giraffes. State of the art. This is a still image of the computerized system that we use to track the facial expressions in our research. You can see it plants a spider web on the gentleman's face, and then it tracks what's called the valence of their facial response, how much expression they're making. And the line goes below the, the dark horizontal line that's more negative expressions, and when it goes above, it's more happy expressions. And the pie chart shows the type of expression they're demonstrating. And this is it in real time as it tracks a subject's face and gives us information about the content and magnitude of expression of the face. And this is what we're using to try to turn the face 
into a diagnostic instrument. But really, the big idea here is a simple idea. And it's the old one. It's the fact that healthcare providers need to use their innate gift, what they want to use anyway, what they actually already use, but implicitly inside their own minds. And instead, we need to turn it into a science that can be documented and turned into a thing that helps us know about patients' wellness to avoid doing unnecessary testing, such as medical imaging that costs thousands of dollars and imparts large doses of radiation. If you find yourself in an emergency department, and statistically 40% of you will in the next year, I hope it's not serious, but if it is, you're with a loved one, I think you should tell your doctor about this talk and ask him or her, what does mom's face tell you? See what kind of discussion you have. I think it'll be more meaningful to you. The second thing is, my friend, the medical record. We need to have a way of documenting the face and we have the technology now to actually videotape the interaction between patients and physicians and turn it into part of the medical record and an actual diagnostic tool. And importantly, for teaching medical care providers. Now, many people that choose to go into the healthcare profession are innately good at this. They can look at other pe people's expressions, but not everybody's great at it. Some people need a little help, and we need to take physician trainees, nurse trainees, and show them how to read people's faces and react with empathy and understand how the face is connected to the body. Because when I see your face, I see you. <laughs>